Uh, getting back to uh, early days again, how happy are you to talk about parents and sister and things? Are you, you okay with talking about them? I know there was a you know bit of an issue with your father and whatever, but do, are you, do you feel like talking about them or is it something you'd prefer not to? Or? Oh no, my... Um... You, you're okay? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, I was four. I remember I was four because I wasn't going to school and my sister was seven and and my father and mother were games people with cards and snakes and ladders and all sorts of things, drafts. And on Sunday afternoon we'd bring out all these things and we'd play, oh, maybe about 10, 15 different types of games, Euchre 500, um, seven, the whole stack of coon can rummy, and they got me in because it was a foursome, my father, mother, sister, and me. So I had to come in. Now I remember losing and crying. Now in, in Burnie, winter was pretty severe there. It was cold. We always had a big open fire burning in the dining room where the games were. So I, I remember crying. And they said, outside, outside in the kitchen. And they put me out and closed the door. I was freezing. And I'm <laughs> sobbing and eventually thought, gee, this is no good. And I said, I'm all right now. And they let me in. And from then after, every time I lost, I smiled. <laughs> because I'd learned. However, uh, I learned these things when I was four. And a lot of them were like casino. You'd put cards down, there might be a four and a three and a three, making ten, so you, if you had a ten you could scoop them up. And So it was mental arithmetic type thing. So when I went to school I was so far in front of all the others with mathematics and things, so that was, that was good training. And I've also I'm a games man now, I like playing chess and all that sort of thing. But that that time I was made. Oh, and if anyone rang the doorbell on Sunday, there'd be a scurry around. We'd have to put all the cards away and everything else because we're a Christian family and you don't play cards on Sunday. Would you believe that? God. But anyway, so um, soon after that, my father, oh no, be four years later when he died. So I, I, I got to play complicated games at four, <laughs> and which has stood me in good stead because when I got out of the Navy I did a vocational guidance test and they said, oh you'd be a good surveyor, but you'd be pretty shit ass at everything else. So. You said your father was um, in the First World War and he got damaged there and that's what eventually caused him to die later on. But do you remember much about his personality and how that might have been affected by the war or anything? Um, no, yes, he was. Uh, he wasn't very well, and my sister was the. He loved my sister, so did my mother, and I seemed to be on, on the other side, on the receiving end, because my sister always said the right thing, and she was lovely to look at, and I might have been an ugly little bugger. I don't know. But uh, I remember I came home from school and we were right on the beach. You could throw a stone in from our place into the water. And I'd, I'd run along the beach and uh, get out on the rocks and away we'd come and I'd scurry away. But I'd go home with these wet boots and I remember I got them soaked and wet and put them outside and the nails rusted and my father had wearing slippers and he started to whack, 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 gave me a hiding with a slipper. And then he stopped. Oh, for thank goodness for that. And, he's, and he got his back, breath back and started again well, when he got a bit more strength. So that's what I remember about that. So he was uh, pretty severe on me, I think. And what about your mother? I think you said that she was fairly tough as well, but what, what, do you, what do you remember about her and how she might have been affected by the war years and the 
and the toughness of growing up and whatever? Oh yes, my mother, <clears throat> she had to look after us while my father was in hospital. <clears throat> so she didn't know it very well. And then she, she used to play the church organ for which she got a pittance, which was good for when you got no money. And then she became she became a music teacher and um, she was really the pianist for Bernie. Any big concerts around or at the 7BU, the local radio station, she'd always be there. Um, and she used to give items, singing items and stuff like that. So she made a living, especially after my father died, because she didn't get a pension for quite a while. And then uh, after a lot of hoo humming and uh, she, they gave her the pension. So that was a big help. But uh, she used to uh, hit me with a stick. I, I was in charge of uh, lighting fires and cleaning fireplaces and things like that. So I'd have to chop sticks and kindling and put it outside. And I remember she'd go out and get one of these sticks and whack me around the legs if I did something or other. So I took them making <laughs> these sticks were so slender if you pick them up they'd break. So that I finished that. And I got to the stage right about 14 when she tried it and I grabbed hold of the stick and out of her hands and broke it. She said, I remember saying, all right, I'll stop your pocket money. <laughs> so we'd have moved into a different stage. Uh, she was all right. We, um, we got on well. My sister and I got on just so well throughout our whole life. She died at the age of 90, about six years ago. And uh, we've always been close. And was she similar to you in the sense that she was good at maths and... Yeah, surprisingly, she could do, multiply three numbers by three numbers, like uh, 347 by 189. You say, what's that? And she'd go, uh, oh, that's uh, 32,000. And so, and I was pretty smart with figures, but I said, how do you do that? If I had it, that's like 181.9, I'd call it 100, 180 and multiply it, and then I got 19, and I'd, yeah, I'd make sort of shortcuts that way. But I said, how do you do it? She said, just the usual way. Multiplying them out like that, and then adding them up. Oh, gee, I, she was really good at that. I could never do that. But she was good, but she, she had a different upbringing. She was always at home. But I was always out in the sea, I made tin canoes and I remember going up about four in the morning to a building site and they had, we'd conned it out, my mate and I, and found there's a sheet of iron up there and it had a nail hole in it so they didn't use it for the roof and they were just had it on the ground. So we went up and snitched this thing and carried it home to the back lawn then spent the this next weekend hammering out all the corrugations and we made a tin canoe out of it by putting a piece of wood uh, about an inch by an inch up just back a bit from the front pulling the two sides up and then folding them over the stick and then hammering nails there and then we would put a packing case apple from the apple at the back and then we'd get a broom stick and saw it in half and get two spaces. And then we'd take that down and you've got to balance them and go out. We had a couple of Cadbury's chocolate things with big round lids on them. And we'd get a big long stick and hammer the round nails on either side for paddles. And as kids we'd go out, I went out once I could see something I'd see. And I was right out near the horizon with this thing. But I cunningly got a piece of hewn pine and we didn't have any tools or anything. If I had any nails, I'd have to 
get a little fire burning in the backyard and put packing cases in there and then go through to where the nails were. But with this uh, block of wood, I think it must have been hue and pine, and I got a red hot poker. We had a big fireplace with a red hot poker. I'd get it red hot, race out the back, and, zzz, and gradually I put a hole through the wood. Then I made a billy cart out of that because I'd, I had a, a, a billy cart with a long piece of wood in the front and then a cross piece with two wheels on it, two wheels at the back and with a hole through both of them then I bought a bolt from the hardware store and put it right through and away I went. But that, that's interesting because that stayed with me steering. I'd sit on the box and I had my two feet on the bar going across. So I'd go downhill and if I wanted to go around to the left I'd push the right one round, so, so it went around to the left. If I wanted to go to the right, the same or the other way, I'd push that one round. Now, when I learned to fly, I, I got my licence for pilot, uh, for Cherokee's flight plane. And I, when, when, you, when you're steering it, you press the, the left one, and you go left, whereas the other one, you push the left out and put the other one in close to go around like that. But this way, you press that. And I did a few circuits, by I got flying by myself solo, and we came in, and you could try and get rid of the crosswind when you come in. So you come in at an angle like that, come in right at an angle, sort of sideways, and then just before you touch down, you swing it around and land, because you can't land with the thing. And when we were coming out, I had a crosswind and I came down and I thought, oh yeah, I've got to swing it around. I reverted back to when I was doing this and it was wrong. So instead of correcting it, it exacerbated it. And the plane went around in a, it's called a ground loop, I found out later. And it went right around sideways and turning around and I remember undoing the safety belt because I could picture myself hanging there when it burst into flames and so by the time it finished there I was all undone ready to jump out. <coughs> I didn't know what to do. I was at the wrong end of the strip facing the wrong way and, the, and I thought oh, I shouldn't really go around straight away because I've heard of people who fall off horses unless they get on straight away they'd never get on a horse again. So I thought I'd better go around again and uh, the voice came through from the tower Romeo Victor uniform return to the parking area and so I had to go in there and they found that there was damage to the nose wheel and thing. So I would have been in real trouble if I did, but I told the, the, the chief flying instructor that when I was coming in, a bit of a tough, a bit of wind sort of swung me round. So uh, that, that wasn't a good time. And what about school days? Was, was it, um, did you have the primary, was it all one school for primary and secondary? No, or separate the primary school? school in Burnie and then you went out to the high school and uh, I was really good in maths and that when I was in grade one and two they'd t take me out with some of the others and I'd take them out of the shelter shed and I'd try and teach them what I knew in mental arithmetic. So that, that was good. That made me feel a little bit superior. But uh, I was just an ordinary by the time I got to high school. I, was, I enjoyed school and soon after that I joined the Navy. So I never got to uh, do the normal things you do from a teenager. But it was idyllic that uh, Bernie, always with the kids playing. 
and we used to play in the Yemu River. And there were about half a dozen of us all going out there, we're all trying to be better than each other. And I was always, I could swim like you wouldn't believe it, I lived in the water. And we all started out up river, towards the mouth of the river, and then we all got underneath, and then the last one to pop up was the winner. And so I was going like crazy on the distance too. And I, I went off course a bit, and there's a bit of a rocky reef coming out, and I was slammed into that head first. And oh, jeez, I staggered up and looked at blood in my hands. So I said, oh, I'm going to give this away. So I got a towel and went home. And in those days, you never went to the doctor because that cost a fortune. But the chemist, so you, everything, if you had a cut or anything, you go to the chemist. And I went in and there's mum teaching Edna, one of her pupils, who was playing there. And, and I went in and said, hey mum, I cut my head. And she looked up, saw a bit about it. Go to, go, go to the chemist. Uh, a sharp there, Edna. And left my... Left me, I stuck it up to the doctor and they looked at it and put a patch there. And, uh, that, that, that's what, the way it was. Whereas here, they, oh gee, go up there, but get a stitch in it, do this, do that. But yeah, mum was a bit. But the good part about it is, I'd go out in the canoe and she wouldn't say, now be careful, because she knew I was so. And uh, so she'd say, come back at six o'clock. And. Uh, well, that's what I was saying with this bit block of wood. I didn't finish it when you put the hole down. I, I tied, I, I put this, bo this block of wood in the back of the canoe and I tied a, about 30 feet of rope to it, coiled around. And we were all playing around on the wharves around there that was pretty deep. And you had to balance them. And I don't know, we had a clash of things and I fell out of mine and it filled up with water and sunk. And I waited around, paddling around and then after a while up came the block of wood with a rope on it. And I thought, geez, I'm smart. And so I almost swam with that over and we pulled it up and got the canoe back again. So that, that, that was really a good thing with all the kids around and playing in the fresh water and salt water and the wharves and fishing and rabbiting and... So that sort of self-reliance, that would have been pretty useful during the war years. It was because it made me independent. When my father died at eight, that left my mother with two kids and no income and anything else. So she shipped me off to a, a childless sister she had who married a bloke at a boot shop in New Norfolk, that's out of Hobart. And they put me on the train, I was eight, with a little suitcase, and we went from Burnie. Now, you go to Western Junction, that's a little place there. And the train continues on to Launceston, but if you wait there, there's another train that's come up from Hobart. So you get out of the train there and hop on the other train and go down to Hobart. And... Uh, Everyone's saying, where's your mother? I said, at home. Well, where's your father? No, you're by yourself. Where are you going? I said, I'm going down to always have a... Well, do you know where to get off? Yeah, I know. And I was so pleased with myself and so independent. And when we came to Western Junction, I got out over the other side. Then we went down to Bridgewater Junction, which is a town just on the Derwent River. And there's my uncle in his chev. Great big soft roof Chev, Chevrolet. And that must have been 1932. And he took me back. I stayed with them for a year. And he had a boot shop. And they were very religious. And uh, in, in the Methodist church, they had, in New Norfolk, they had pews, little, like, like little stalls. And you open the door and close it and sit down and everyone had their own pew and they, they had a rug, their own rugs there and cushions 
and it was fantastic because I could get down now I could see me and I'd play throughout the whole sermon but by then I was an atheist and I couldn't stand what the preacher was saying or the minister and uh, but anyway I stayed there for a year and that was good and then I went back home and resumed a normal life with my mum. But that made me really independent and the fa fact that I could travel from Birmingham to Hobart virtually a couple of, over a couple of, under, a couple of, under miles by myself made me really feel good.